And hello, everybody. Excuse me. <clears throat> Welcome to History Pitch. I think we're at number nine now on this, the 24th day of January 2013. I'd like to begin. Hello, everybody. Hello. We've got a few assortment of people in the studio, which we'll, we'll, we'll introduce in a minute. But I do want to begin with an apology about the failure, my failure, to podcast last week's show. This was due to the wheels falling off the Tamsin show, and primarily I lost the memory stick. But I recovered it this morning, so the world is to rights again, and uh, we'll get that up. We'll get that up um, during the week, today, I hope. So, to today in history, no, no, not yet. What do we have on the show today? We've got Erica is back, and Erica is going to be talking about HMV, which is very exciting. Uh, Simon, we've got Simon. He's going to be talking about the Beatles. And Tavinda is here with a beard slash babe. And we have a special guest, Julia. Julia is going to be telling us who she thinks she is. Josie has some lucky people slash potentially a person, a personified cat. And um, and we um, Ben the Bodhi should be coming too, I hope. So it's all very good. It's all very good. But let us go, as we usually do, to this day in history. Tavinda, hello. Hello, Tamsin. How are you? I'm very good. How are you? Uh, did you survive the snow? I didn't go out in the snow, so yes, I survived the How snow. How is that possible? I hibernated. <laughs> For four days? I did. Well, I did. You didn't go to lectures. <laughs> no, I, well, you weren't here on Friday, and then it was that the weekend. That is not your Friday morning. Let everybody, and especially the administration of Brunel University, know. <laughs> Sorry, I just wasn't here on Friday. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's a pretty major achievement. You must have been living off baked beans and kind of dry bread by the end. Well, my parents were running errands, so it was fine. Oh, my God. Okay. <laughs> this doesn't make me sound very self-sufficient. No, no. Part of the value yeah. of the university. I live in my room and live off cookies. There yeah. we go. Is that it teaches you to be independent, ladies and gentlemen. Um, okay, so what happened to Vinda then? You would have had all weekend to work out what happened on this day in history. Well, today was quite interesting. Uh, Charles, Julia, you can talk. Charles Julia. Darwin was elected member of Royal Society, the Royal Society, in 1839. Mm -hmm. And in 1935, the first canned beer went on sale. Oh, wow. So the can of beer, first time 1935. 1935. In 1935. So, so that's a relatively recent piece. Yeah, of really recent. Seeing as you know, sort of tinned meat and stuff was around mm. a lot longer than that. How do, I guess it's about the pressurizedness, mm. keeping the air in. Yeah. Gosh, half of British culture has been you know, revolutionized. <laughs> Centers around. <laughs> yeah, by the can, the, the tinny. By the tinny. Uh, 1965. Winston Churchill dies. So today is the death anniversary of I mean, Winston Churchill. People, have people seen the amazing, um, what's it called, uh, video footage of the Winston Churchill's funeral? Yeah. Yeah, and the, and the barge sails down the Thames. Yeah. Yeah, and all the all the cranes that are that used to line the Thames because it was you remember an industrial river lower their um, uh, beams in salute. It's quite incredible. You can see it at the Churchill Archive. It's yeah, funny. I um, went to the Churchill uh, War Museum in um, Whitehall. Yeah. And um, you can see it all there, and they've got a really big um, mm. monument to it. And you can see the video and everything, and it's quite, it's quite iconic. Mm. It's really good. Quite iconic. It's a bit like being quite unique, isn't it? <laughs> or quite pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> it's very unique then. No, you can't be very. You can't be very pregnant. Can you be very pregnant? No, you're either pregnant or you're not yeah, pregnant. Triplet. Well, you're still pregnant. Well, it's depends, like even more pregnant. Depends the stage of pregnancy. You could be like. I don't think so. You know. I think you can be pregnant, fat. but you can't see it. <laughs> yeah, I think you're either. There's pregnant degrees or... of fatness, but it's whether you're either pregnant or you're not. Yeah, the same like unique. You're either unique. Okay, then it was, you're like then you're it was unique. Else. Full stop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, okay, there's your grammatical lesson for this morning. Um, so, uh, do we have anything else to vendor? Well, something that's quite, you know, prevalent in people's minds at the moment, mm -hmm. the film Les Miserables. The, it opened today for the first time at Theatre Theatre St. Denis in Montreal in 1991. So the people Ooh. of Montreal, it came to you the first time in 1991. Yep. Uh, sorry, was that the first time it... Came to them, oh, not I the see. first that, time that, it opened ever. That was a pretty pathetic fact. I'm sorry. sorry. <laughs> right. Let, let's move on swiftly, um, because... Um, 
we're, we're, we're trawling the bottom. Oh, Australia got all out for 674 versus India in 1948. There's a pathetic fact for you. <laughs> Although I do feel like it's important to talk about Australia today because today is the 24th of January and on the 26th of January it is the anniversary of the day Captain Cook claimed Australia for Britain. This is known sometimes as Australia Day by most of the population but there is a large movement to call it Invasion Day. Woohoo! Not woohoo, but yeah. <laughs> so that's uh, some politics playing out in my homeland. And if you're in my first year class, I'm going to force upon you some um, political speeches tomorrow. Fun for you. Uh, okay, <laughs> so let's, uh, let's move on to see what Erica has to say. Erica. Hello, Erica. Hello, Tamsin. How are you doing? I am not too bad. Did you survive the cold? I'm just about surviving. I'm still dressed as a pillow, though. Oh, that's that's nice. That's nice. That protects you from the world. Keep it at bay. Exactly. Yeah. But, and also, I've got this is this is almost irrelevant, but I've got ear flaps. That oh. you, they, they 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 clip into my cycling helmet for cold days. O M G. It's it's a, an amazing thing. But anyway. <laughs> Yeah, moving on and going straight into history. The other feeling I have, apart from being cold, is being sad about the demise of HMV. I know, the high street will not look the same. Well, exactly, exactly. And as I was saying to my heistmate last night, that whole process of, do you remember when you just sit there and you just go through albums mm. slowly when you're about 15? I don't think 15 years, do they do that? No. But let's talk about, should we talk about the history of HMV? Oh, yes. Do you know it was founded in the 1890s? I did not know that. Okay, well, maybe it's time we need to unpack this together because, as a historian of the post war world, I need your help on this. But I know, um, I know nothing about HMV in the 1890s. Well, maybe you should Wikipedia. Oh, all right, okay, I'm typing it in as we speak. HMV history. So, when I heard that HMV was found in the 1890s, I thought, ooh, there's definitely history there. There's What's definitely the history there. That date signals hist. Okay. It sounds to me like history. Oh, you're absolutely right. Um, HMV begins in the 1890s at the dawn of the disc gramophone era. Uh, but that's all we that's all we've get. By by 1902, it become the beginnings of the gramophone company. And in February 1907, they commenced building of a new record factory at Hayes, which is near where Axbridge is, near Brunel. And then in 1921, the gramophone company opens the first dedicated HMV shop in Oxford Street. <laughs> And Elgar, the composer, participates in the opening ceremonies. Now that is not something you expected. Oh my God, this sounds fantastic! I, I like I, this sounds like a nexus of commerce, power, uh, culture. You know, like this is this is the 1920s for you, isn't it? This so is 19, this is totally the 1920s. But into all historians out there, its its roots go back before the war. I mean, this I'm becoming one. You know, this great debate about is the war disruptive or not? Like, I think I'm definitely in the not category. Uh, okay, that's good. Maybe any interwar historians out there can tweet in. <laughs> yeah, interwar historians <laughs> tweet <laughs> <do it. Yeah. laughs> in. That's no totals. Because interwar historians obviously need the Great War to be some great rupture. Otherwise they don't They're not, exist. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. What's the point what's the point of being an interwar historian if that's totally uh, anachronistic, I suppose. So hang on, I've got some more factoids. In, uh -huh. in 1931, the Gramophone Company then merges with Columbia Gramophone Company to form Electric and Musical Industries. And from then on, HMV manufactures radio and TV sets. So they also go from culture into hardware, which is kind of what Apple's doing. Um, well, this is interesting because as a historian of technology, this is what we call the second machine age, isn't it? Is that oh, right? it's what, oh, I'll tell you some history now. Rainer Bannum coins the term the second machine age to talk actually about the 1960s, but you know, I suppose you could actually date it a bit earlier. The first machine age is the introduction of large scale machines, like you know, the industrial revolution, yeah. and the second machine age is when people start getting domestic machines in their homes, so things like vacuum cleaners, kettles, radios. Okay. So, and that's actually something that's happening during the 20th century, and it's quite hard to date because really, when do people actually get? When do most people own a vacuum? You can talk about vacuum cleaners, you know, from 
the interwar period or whatever. But when people actually start using them, most people, probably the 1960s. Mm. So I think it sounds like HMV is part of this process of, of introducing domestic electronic consumables into the home. Yeah, totally. And 1930s, uh, that fits with your chronology, um, really yeah. effectively, began to expand yeah. its retail operations in the 1960s. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Throughout there the 1970s, the company doubles in size. What do historians say about the demise of the second machine age then? Oh, I didn't think they're even saying it. They're even really saying it yet, right? Because if you think about it, the demise, what? The, the sort of revolution towards these, um, well, when an awful lot of the stuff we own, we do not physically own, but it's all on our laptop. Actually, it's only taken place in the last 10 years, right? right. So... Do not ask me. My great memory of HMB is in the 1990s when I used to sort of almost substitute retail stuff for actual real meaningful relationships and used to just like hang about in HMB trying to flirt with the shop assistants who were kind of stuck there and had to talk to me. So for me, it was a really, really important place for like, you know, youth sociability and that this world that was tended not to be entered by adults. Like it was a real place, HMV. In a so the young... Small the youth went there and what did they what did you do did you meet other youth there like lurking in the rock pop aisle yeah i think we actually did i think we did and i think this is a, um like a real part of that whole sort of well it, something that's happened since the 1960s of of pop like music culture being sort of central to mm. youth identity right yeah, I mean, I've just been talking to Simon, or we will be about to talk to Simon <laughs> when this radio goes out, about, uh, and he was convincing me that the Beatles have ruined pop, pop music. And one of his points was that they, they herald the beginning of this individualisation of consumption, and you're talking about a kind of group experience still. Right in these spaces. Um, yeah, I think so. I think so. When we get X Factor, and then when we download a song via iTunes. Yeah, yeah, maybe you're right, actually. But actually, the I think the interesting thing is that it's all done through commerce, right? Like '60s culture. One of the arguments about the culture of the 1960s is it's a culture. It's like a subculture that's wholly based around commerce and things like Carnaby Street and Soho. These are all things about selling. Yeah, mm. so it's interesting interesting that actually if HMB is central to this, it's just another example of subcultures being based around selling. Mm, yeah, but, but now we're seeing subcultures still based around selling, but without the spaces that bring people together. When yeah, selling exactly. had to happen in the physical world, we had to come and you could flirt with the salesman. You can't flirt with the iTunes. Amazon. Yeah. Yes, God. <laughs> Don't know how that works. Which is sad, right? Yeah, I think it's a bit depressing. I... I'm going to say, I don't have the internet at home. I'm also, I sort of believe that the internet sort of witchcraft. And I don't get what happens if your computer dies and you spend all this money on, on music. I, like, I'm sure, maybe it's, I don't know, maybe it's people tell me I'm stupid, but I still buy CDs. I still, I still go to the music shop and buy a CD normally, so once every couple of weeks. Really? So I'm not, yes, I'm so, not part of it. So well, what are you going to do? HMV is going to disappear from your life and... Well, do you know what? I have to say, I deserted HMV as much as the sort of online generation deserted HMV because I wanted this sort of intimate experience that was not getting an HMV. So I like to go to sort of independent music stores. And do you know what? I still do it. I still sort of stoke up conversation with the people working in there. Only this time I'm not sort of trying to, I don't know, flirt with them. I actually just like, tell me what to buy. I'm not trendy enough anymore to know myself. And normally they tell me what to buy. And that's quite nice because I like talking about music with these people. So uh, I think it was the, the, the people who were still buying music physically didn't want to buy it from... Most of and b shops, to me, look like multi-story car parks. They didn't want to buy it in this sort of environment. So I think it failed on both counts. So well, perhaps what you're seeing in Ling is the return of the independent retailer, and wouldn't that be a great thing? Well, actually, you know what? That could be what happens with HMB, but it allows many flowers to bloom, you know, because it's not... This of behemoth of the high street is gone. So, well, you know. on that note, Erica... That's a good note to end. Hope, hope springs. Hope. But thank you very much. Okay, I will see you soon. Bye. Thank you very much, Erica. I must say, despite um, at, you know that hopeful note that we ended on, um, Erica and I went to the HMV in Leicester and trawled over the bones of the carcass of the dying HMV. I found two videos, which was quite nice. I think she got a CD. Um, so back to the studio. Uh, 
We're now going to turn to Julia, and Julia's last name, I think, is Way. Is that right? It is. Oh, yes. very. Oh, hang on. There you are. Say hello. Yes. Hi, everyone. Yes, yes Julia's last name is Way. She confirmed that was well done, Tamsin. Um, so, Julia, who who are you, and who do you think you are? Um, that's a really interesting question. I think I'm just a product of immigration and immigrants, to be honest with you. Cause... So where did your set of immigrants come We all are. We all are, ladies yeah. and gentlemen. That's um, what we're finding out here on this segment. Yeah, medium. Medium. Oh, Josie, Josie, we can do you next week. Um, what, um, not literally, of course. What, um, <laughs> we, where are your set of immigrants from, Julia? Well, um... My father's uh, surname is Way, but my mother's maiden name is Nosek, um, which is from the well, what now is the Czech Republic, but at the time which was Czechoslovakia. Um, so my grandfather was from um, the Sudetenland. Mm-hmm. This is your maternal grandfather. Yeah, yeah. And uh, his name was Karl Heinz, and uh, he was born in the Sudetenland in sort of the 1920s. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, he had a really interesting life. Um, he was born, and um, when he was about 10, the Nazis invaded. Mm. Um, and he was, well, we, from the research I've done, he was subjected to Germanization because he uh, spoke German. And um, when the Nazis. So, hang on, he spoke German. His name is Karl Heinz. Heinz. And you're saying he's not German? Well, he always said that he was Czech. I mean, he mm. died before I was born, but from mm. what I found, he always said that he was Czech. Mm. Um, but, but there might... I don't know if you came to the talk last week, did you? To the Isambard Centre talk? It was very topical about this. Like, mm. what are the strategic... I mean, this is Alison Carroll. Hello, Alison Carroll. Um, there are, there are, you know, reasons that people might want to strategically craft their identities in some, certain political moments. Well, exactly. And I think when he came over um, during the war as a refugee, I mean, it's pretty obvious that he may have wanted to say, yeah, I'm Czech, not that I'm German, because Germans weren't received particularly well in Britain during and after the war. So um, that's kind of understandable. But um, it's difficult to say, because obviously I never met him, but um, he always said that he was Czech. But a lot of people in that area spoke uh, Czech and German, or just Czech or just German, um, because of the changes in the border kind of over the last 20, 30 years. Um, so he, um, I think he would have experienced a lot of problems with his school and a lot of... Um, things like that, um, and kind of pressure to swear his allegiance to um, the German Reich. And his father, Joseph, um, was a woodworker, and he um, was a member of a socialist party of some kind, so we think that wouldn't have been received very well either. So in 1941, the whole family upped and left and fled in the middle of the night. It's um, quite late in the war, really. Mm. How come... They left it so late. Well, um, again, it's one of these things we don't know, but from, again, like research and kind of what we can surmise, we think that, um, you know, it would have been just um, pressure, pressure building. And also, um, I mean, Carl was about 10 or 12 at this time, but he had two younger siblings. One at the time in 1941 would have been four, and the other one would have been two. So you think you may not have wanted to flee with two such young children at that time. Um, and if you think in 19, sort of 39 maybe... They would have been even younger, and um, his mother may have been pregnant. So. Okay, so they come over to England in 1941 in yeah. the de- dark of the night. How do they make that crossing? Again, or well, I think that they... Um, I don't know anything for concrete, because everyone's... Speculative history, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, not speculative history. Um, but I think that... I mean, they said they had to drop everything, and they couldn't take anything with them in the dead of the night and go. And uh, so I think that he, they must have had connections with the underground, and they must have gone that way. Because if you think about it... At that time in, in Czechoslovakia, where, how would you've got, it was all Nazi-occupied territory up to France. So um, we think they must have gone through an underground um, right. thing, which so, must have been pretty scary, I think, you know, if you think about it, with two young kids, or well, three young kids, um, to, to pick up and, and go and make it, actually. So somehow they get across the channel, yep. and they're in Britain, and where do they settle? Well, they're sent, first of all, as refugees to the Lake District, um, and then eventually they settle... Um, in, in Harrow, not Fulton, which is where I live. Um, and, yeah, um, he kind of, he, he grew up and he um, joined the army, was in the parachute regiment and all this, this sort of stuff. This is after the war in the 1950s, isn't Yeah. Um, I'm not even sure what action he saw, because uh, he died. Um, but, um, but obviously after his action, but he died um, of a heart attack when he was about 56, when my mother was about 26. So, so I he know. married whom? He married... Um, an Irish lady. Another um, immigrant. Another immigrant <laughs> called um, 
Eileen, and um, it was quite a funny story about how they was met, she actually. Yeah. Was he Catholic? Yes. It's on his immigration record with a nice RC next to it. Mm. Um, so he married an Irish lady, um, and they met his mother, um, Anna, was in hospital um, for some reason, and my grandmother, uh, Eileen, was in hospital as well, and they were in the beds next to each other, and she had a picture of her son on the, on the oh, table next to... in hospital! <laughs> yeah, and literally, like. oh, he looks nice! <laughs> Who's that? Oh, it's my son, do you want me to introduce you the next time he comes in to see me? And literally, uh, she set them up and... Hilarious. Yeah, I know. <laughs> NHS, bring people together. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that's, that's how they met. Um, and on my dad's side of the family, um, he, I mean, they're fairly English, but um, my grandfather grew up in India. Um, I think his father must have done something in the railways in India, um, but as a British man. And um, we think that possibly... So he grew up speaking fluent Urdu. Irish. And, Again, Irish? No, English. No, English. Um, you and, said that, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> and he, um, so we think somewhere far back there may have been some... Um, kind of in a few generations before my granddad, there may have been some Anglo-Indian canoodling. I can't see you on radio. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you can, though. Um, some Anglo-Indian um, canoodling. I'm, I'm um, asthma Yes. Um, must have gone on, and we think there possibly was some... Um, to, so there's some Indian blood in there um, that uh, maybe his father or his father's father had a relationship with an Indian woman. Um, so I'm, I'm Czech, I'm Indian, I'm... And then um, he came over, he uh, had to leave India, I think because of Indian independence, mm. and all that was kind of the, you know, it's time to go back, and came over, um, back to England. And yeah, so um, I'm from all over. But my, my grandmother, the woman he married, was actually English, so I have, I have one bit of English in me. <laughs> well, let David Cameron listen to this, David Cameron. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure he is. I'm sure he's one of our many listeners. Um, uh, thank you very much, Julia. That is fascinating. So um, let us turn now to... Uh, what should we do now? Uh, we have to welcome Artemis, who is Hello. falling Yay. asleep. Hello, Artemis. Hello. Hi, hi, hi. Uh, let us turn now to um, Simon. Uh, where are you, Simon? Um, here, here you are. Play. Simon. Hello, goodbye. Hello, goodbye. Hello. Hello. Oh, I see what you've done there. Hello, hello. Yes. Um, you... you say hello, I say goodbye. <laughs> you say hello, I say goodbye. Um, OK, so we, if you haven't worked this out, people, uh, are talking about the Beatles. Simon is going to tell me why the B Beatles ruined pop music. Let's say why the Beatles ruined popular music, not the why the Beatles ruined... Pop Look, we, we're going to have a Australia Day special next week. You can, like, take the piss out of me then. But what, what's this? It's not poppy music, it's popular music? It's not pop music, it's popular music. What's the difference? Well, pop music is a genre where it's popular music covers whatever people find popular. Oh, I see. Yes, you do. Okay, so all right, but the Beatles, the Beatles are the greatest band of all time. I mean, my mother, even I have heard of the Beatles. That is really quite a high bar to uh, cross. I don't know who the Grimes are. What was the other person we were talking about the other day? It's not the Grimes, it's Grimes, and she's a, she's a woman in her early 20s. There you are. See, and I know that the Beatles have four people in them, and they come from Liverpool. So how can they not be great? Well, I think the distinction between great which is debatable, and best-selling, which is not so debatable. Those are hard figures there. And the Beatles are the biggest band in the world, and that loads of those. So why did they sell so many albums? Well, what I would argue there is that they took, in many ways, kind of black music, you could even argue Jewish music, and they smoothed it out. They made it sort of acceptable for uh, a mainstream audience. But this, okay, so what you called smoothing out is also what other people call innovation. And doesn't innovation drive change? I mean, this is, this is crucial to the way we consume all forms of culture. But it's a kind of innovation which was very expensive. So the, the, um, George Martin famously working within the studio, using the studio for the first time as an instrument. So the Beatles had a huge amount of money behind them. And it was a sound which could in many ways be replicated. I mean, you can tell that something's been very well produced. And that's what people want to hear. They want to hear 
heavily produced, smoothed out music. That's what you can listen to on all the kind of popular stations now. And what's wrong with that? Well, what's wrong with that is you move from a situation in which music is uh, communal, uh, music is something you experience in person, uh, music is something that kind of everyone can kind of contribute towards, towards something that's more top down. It's being produced for you and you consume it as an individual or with a small group of people. What? So you're saying that Beatles privatised music or individualised music? Well, I think this is a process which you can date back to before the war, but the Beatles kind of crystallised that. And what added to it with the Beatles as well was they were the first to experience this kind of mass hysteria around them. But that's a communal experience, that mass hysteria. There are girls lining up at airports and fainting in the body, in the person. It's not a kind of disembodied uh, experience listening to the Beatles. That's a good point. But what I, would, what I would then counter is that there's not too much difference between the Beatles and the X Factor. You know? Yeah, everyone says, oh, why can't we get someone, you know, like, you know, we're not going to find any Beatles on the X Factor. But what you do get is something that's heavily produced, that's something which is trying to inspire this kind of hysteria in people. And then you download the single as a souvenir of it. And this is, what, this is kind of the model which, not necessarily what the Beatles wanted, not necessarily what John Lennon and Paul McCartney wanted, but it's what the record labels recognised they could do with the Beatles and what they could then do with everyone else. So when, we, when we're watching X Factor, we're sitting in our, telev- in our homes, watching television. Yes. Downloading, you know, whoever it is, latest highly produced single. We're not buying the album. We're not watching it with people. No. And we well, you're not, I, mean, you, I mean, you're not in a uh, pub listening to a new band coming through. You know, you're not uh, in some club trying to listen to a new MC coming through. You know, you, you're there and you, you're listening to something just being heavily manipulated. Um, so, and you're purchasing as well. Yeah, and I, I'm persuaded by all of this. How does this change what music means to us? Like, the job that music does in our subject, fashioning our subjectivity? Well, I think it does take this big, this is big step from being creative in a more expansive way to being creative and you're kind of trying to kind of read into something that's already been created for you things. So it's, there's, there's less room for uh, people to be creative, people to kind of impose their own sense of self and Ironically, so ironically, the loss of the communal um, performance of music leads to a lack of individuality and creativity. Wow, we're sounding very intelligent today, aren't we? We better stop. We yeah. better stop. I think this was very interesting. I think I learned a lot about the Beatles today, Simon. Maybe you won even. Wow. Well. <laughs> so, Simon, I'm enjoying quite a lot. You're, you're, you're taking me into unknown territory. So I think next week you can perhaps take me to the world of football, which I know less about than I do about music. Okay. Um, oh, and also, as an Australian, yeah. you're in trouble for using the football. Oh, what is it called? Oh, yeah, soccer, I know. Yeah. But I took the how British am I test, see? I'm, I'm learning. Yeah? Yeah. Are you worried the government are listening into you? <laughs> That's right, they'll kick me up. But so, soccer is the largest growing sport in Australia, actually, so, you know, wait. Wait for us to win the World Cup in 50 years. So there's this guy that I understand his name is Seth Blatter. Yep. He's a bit... He's not loved. No, he's not. Not loved. So I would like you to side with Seth Blatter and tell you me want why. The guy. You want me to side with the guy who said that women's footballers should be wearing really tight shorts? Yes, I mean, that's, that's the sentiment that <laughs> you share, is it not? <laughs> no, I, I'm a, a great believer in women's football. I'm very supportive <laughs> of women's football. OK, well, you have no trouble siding with Sepp then. Um, why did England not invent football? Oh, it's, God, right, OK. Isn't it, isn't it the 150th anniversary next year? I mean, next week? No, it's, it's, it's the 100th anniversary on Tuesday. On Tuesday. Yeah, yeah, that's Tuesday. Right, so that's your task? Yeah, OK, excellent. Thank you for that. No worries, but have a good week in the meantime. Don't worry too much about it. Bye. Bye, Simon. Bye. Thank you very much, Simon. Football. I look forward to learning about football next week. I know nothing about football. Um, but here we are. Artemis has arrived with food, um, which we have just posted on the Facebook page. Um, but So while I'm eating, Josie. Hello, Josie. Hello. You're a bit sick. Yeah, a little bit. So I apologise if my voice goes. Oh, shame. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's pretty unlucky. 
very, very badly timed. Badly timed. Um, yeah, voice that you could whisper like this. I could whisper, but I don't know whether it would come out very well. Okay. No. Well, um, who, what luckiness do you have to tell us about? Okay, so it turns out that most lucky people in history actually end up being dictators. So I've moved on from people, and I'm going on to animals. So okay. today we have a cat, um, and it's a cat <laughs> called Unsinkable Sam, but also sometimes known as Oscar. So he started off working on the Bismarck, the battleship, uh, in 1941. Sorry, was, sorry, what did the cat... How was he working <clears throat> on the Bismarck? He was just sort of like the cruise cat. If there are rats or mice on board, okay. hunt them down. Was he unionised? I mean, um, he was an unknown crew member's cat that they brought on board with them. Okay. So we don't know Let's how old he is, or kind of, yeah. But basically, um, the Bismarck sank, <laughs> and of the 2,200 crew, 115 people survived, and the cat. Um, <laughs> so he was rescued by the British who were returning, um, and he was he ended up going on for. Um, the HMS Cossack for six more months, which then got hit by a torpedo and then um, sank kind of slowly. It killed like 159 crew members. But the cat was saved and brought ashore, and he was ashore <coughs> for a little bit. Um, and then one month later, on HMS Ark Royal, it was torpedoed again. Okay. Like he, so he's some kind of target, really. Um, and it sank slowly. And so only one crew member died from that. But Sam was found sort of clinging to a plank of wood. And he was described as angry but quite unharmed. (laughs) (laughs) So imagining whoever rescued him had to deal with a very, very angry, (laughs) angry cat. Um, So after that, he was retired. And then he died in 1955. So he was quite an old cat. But he has a portrait in the National Maritime Museum. This is brilliant. (laughs) Yeah. I'm so into him. What was his other name, Sam or... Uh, Unsinkable Sam or Oscar. I think Oscar is the name of the portrait at the museum. Oh, there's no reason he's not called Unsinkable Sam. This is brilliant. I mean, mate, what's that film that's out on the moment about the tiger on the boat? A life, life of Pi. Life of Pi. Basically, he is the tiger. <laughs> right? That's what happened. Yeah. Yeah. Um... That's brilliant. Thank you very much, JC. I think, I think, I think that's the winner so far. <laughs> Definitely beats Hitler. Um, <laughs> you struggled through nobly. So let us turn now to Ben the Boaty, who is. Whoa, hello. hello. Nearly hit myself with the microphone. That's embarrassing. <laughs> All right. Yeah, good start. Yeah. Um, so we we always want an update on your uh, hygiene. How how are things going in the freezing? An update on my hygiene. <laughs> uh, I'm quite clean, thank you very has much. Has the, the boiler frozen? Is there? There's, there isn't a boiler. There's a water clarifier. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, no, I moved to my end in a snowstorm on Sunday. That was good uh... fun. And uh, my boat got unloosed. It got it got set loose when I was uh, in Bering Street, possibly by uh, annoying children. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I was woken up floating at about. 11.30 at night, yeah, I sleep early. <laughs> and uh, by somebody knocking my door going, oh, you're drifting, you're drifting. And I was like, oh, that's scary. So some I think youths, it might have been him, the guy who let me... Yes. Let you loose. Uh, so, some Islington youths. Islington even, youths. even uh, Yeah, middle-class youths, yeah, probably. Yeah, that's middle-class fun for you. <laughs> it's just, oh, let's let the boat... <laughs> 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 uh, yeah, that's how it works. Um, Gosh, so there's a bit of drama. I know, bit of drama, now. snow, biscuits. Oh, my God, it's been, it's been a week. Biscuits. Yeah. Okay, we'll okay. move on from that. Uh, I, don't, I don't think we need an explanation. Um, so <laughs> you're going to tell us about another anthropologist. Last yeah. week, um, because of my technical um, incompetence, you did not hear us talk about... Um, Bronislav Malinowski. Malinowski. But you will, of course, listen to the back issue before you play this one. Obviously, so, because, you know, that's, that's important. Mm-hmm. It's important that we know about um, functionalism and structural functionalism. <laughs> before. Oh, my God, my boring lectures in anthropology. Sorry, everyone. Uh, so, before so we, we move on... on to the next, um, yeah, you wanted me to talk about um, Margaret Mead, but I don't know anything about her. So we're just going to go through anthropological theory in sort of order of developments, I think. Okay. And we're going to go on to the next big thing in anthropology. It's Structuralism! Gonna, it's gonna, woo! Okay, woo It's going to be... <laughs> 
It's going to be more exciting than that, though, isn't it? Yeah. No, it's not going to be in any way more exciting than that. It's going to be really boring. Put some people back into structure. OK, that's fine. Uh, Artemis is now clinging to the walls because she's so distressed by this. <laughs> this is, um, Artemis, okay. I know how Artemis you want some people? sociology. Oh, God, OK, I'm really, really sorry. Um, Quickly. Well, people, people, people. OK, um, the god daddy of structuralism was Claude Levi-Strauss, okay. uh, who you might recognise from linguists. Yeah. Uh, came up, oh, don't Quickly. sigh. He came sex up with. It up. Okay, I'm going to sex it up. Okay, and talk about incest. He wrote a book called The. <laughs> that's not a good book. I'm sorry if that's a bad sexing it up, but you know, I'm doing my best here. He wrote a book called The Raw and the Cooked, okay, where um, it's, it's about binaries, basically. He said the human mind thinks in binaries, we split things, in, uh, split things into thing or not thing. So, Raw and the Cooked was about um, how. Symbolically and in terms of the language that we use, raw stuff is like people that we can't have sex with, so close family incest, and so symbolically in the in myths and things, those things are equated. Whereas cooked, fine to eat, equals fine to have sex with. So there we go. Human mind split into binaries. We uh, we organise society by binaries, quite different from the functionalists who had this biological model whereby society was just a cohesive system of organs working together in order to make everything work harmoniously. Structure is say no it's all about symbols and it's all about binary oppositions okay that, you did a brilliant job with pow that. yeah i know right I um, that. so great okay so who i'm going to talk about very briefly i'm so sorry now josie's falling asleep is mary <laughs> douglas because you wanted a woman i've got a woman for you mary douglas cool. i'm excited um okay. she should be a babe in beard and babe by the way because she's brilliant um <laughs> wrote lots of stuff about consumption and question, about question. drinking cultures yes can we have a small date range when does she active um in the well Structuralism's big thing in the 60s. She was born in uh, born in 21, I think, because I had checked her Wikipedia before I came out. Died only a couple of years ago. Um, oh, well, no, five years ago now, 2007. Okay. But uh, And worked at uh, UCL for most of her life and wrote lots of things and was a bit brilliant. But basically, structuralism gets interesting when we take it away from Claude Levi-Strauss and his just, distinct, uh, just idea of binaries, yeah. this or that, and look at the space in between. Ambi- ambiguous things in the middle... Mm-hmm. Liminality. Which liminality, yeah. Ooh. So you've got Victor Turner talking about liminality, you've got Edmund Leach and people like that. But Mary Douglas writes Purity and Danger, which is one of the most important books in the whole of anthropology. And basically, she was looking at what we do when we can't split things into definitive categories and how that's upsetting for us, and came up with one of the only real anthropological maxims, because anthropology, it's very wishy-washy, we don't decide anything for sure, but one of the, uh, but one of the few actual definitive statements in anthropology is Mary Douglas saying that dirt is matter out of place. That means that something that is a categorically complex, we don't like, and it's dirty or polluting. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so think um, hair in the plug hole. Yeah. Okay, it's biological matter, so it, uh, it's living, so it should be on the body. We find it disturbing yeah. because it's in a not living place. Yeah. Dirt is matter out of place. And she did a brilliant analysis of Leviticus when she talked about why are all of these animals um, banned by a uh, band? Because they're weird. They don't fit into simple ca- uh, categories. Things with cloven, cloven hooves, which also eat. Biscuits? I don't know. Right. I can't remember. But yeah, no, things which don't fit simply into binary categories. We find dirty or polluting, therefore yeah. we have um, ritual prescriptions against them. And she is awesome, so there. That, that, oh, ow. Um, Sorry. That, no, but that, that is... That, a, your description, your, that was a tour de force, <laughs> which was I love awesome. structuralism. Yeah, well, I it's really taken, do. it's coming back. And yeah. we must, as historians, not... Uh, be too snide about this because the whole of the cultural turn and cultural history is massively influenced Mm -hmm. by anthropological thinkers, particularly structures. So this is a very important, right? I think that, well, no anthropologist working around now would call themselves a structuralist because it's very much the thing in the 60s and the thing that moved us away from away from functionalism and towards this lovely, symbolic, murky world of anthropology. Um, But nobody would actually call themselves a structuralist, but still it's so important. It's such a Mm. great way of thinking through Mm. so much that happens. And what... Okay, so what comes next? What do we have next? Oh, next we... If... (sighs) 
I suppose the next big development, we're going to talk about cultural uh, American cultural anthropology, okay. symbolic anthropology, Clifford Geertz. Yeah, Does that sound like good yeah, fun? Yeah, that sounds great. We'll do that. We'll, 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 uh, yeah, we'll do the history of anthropology, and I'll try and make it interesting, and then we can, I can just do some anthropologists who are a bit odd after we finish that, if excellent, you like. Excellent, excellent. Okay. That was brilliant, Ben. Cool, no worries. I was into that majorly. Um, now, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that says more about me. Yeah. Um, so we're going to now call Rob Priest. Uh, now, of course, you'll remember there was a slight dispute, because um, you will have listened to the podcast, about Rob Priest and, um, and the last um, uh, 60 seconds he did. So we'll, we'll see if we can get him on the phone. Here we are. Hello, Rob. Come, come on in. Maybe he's not going to answer. Ooh. We'll take that personally. Maybe he's not home. Okay, so while we try and get Rob, <laughs> we might. Oh, is that his, his Hi, voice? you're speaking to Rob at Priest. I'm not here Hello. right now. I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Please leave your message after the tone. To re record your message, key hash at any time. Hello, Rob Priest. We were just ringing because he wanted to know about Ernst Renan and what he thought about radio. So if you could, <laughs> if you could possibly call me back, um, you have my number. I won't read it out on air. That would be much really gratefully received. If you're currently making a cup of tea, that's okay. We'll forgive you. But if you're ignoring our phone calls deliberately, we'll be very sad. Okay, bye. Uh, all right, we tried. So um, Artemis. What? Artemis. Come, come and be our friend. Set fire to your hair Poke a stick at a grizzly bear Eat medicine that's out of date Use your private parts as piranha bait Dumb ways to die So many dumb ways to die Dumb ways to die So many dumb ways to die Um... Hello. Hello. Good morning. Why is it so cold? Come on. I know. I know. Well, it's your country, my country, we don't believe in the cold. No, no. Come on. I'm depressed these days. Yeah. And I eat a lot. What, what, what are we going to do with that? I don't know. Maybe more ouzo. This is the only way forward. Okay. <laughs> I have like six bottles at home. I'm going to start bringing one a week. Yeah, well, that could get a three at the end of term. That would be brilliant. Great. Um, so you've, you've been suffering. Yes, yeah. I have been suffering. I'm sorry. Even though that. I love the snow, I can't. I, I, I can't do with the cold. It's, it's too much. Our boiler broke. Oh. It was bad. It was very bad. What did you do? We froze. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. And then we called every gas company we could, and one came the next day, so that was better. But we also had to carry hot water kettles of hot water to the bath mm. to wash. It was terrible. Um, anyway. Back to the studio. Um, so, dumb ways to die. Dumb ways to die, yes. That would be dumb. Yes. But freezing yes. to death? Well, I have one. Oh, I have one that froze death, actually, for the day. Uh, first, we're going to start with the ski list. You know a ski list, don't you know? The drama writer, the ancient Greek drama writer. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, uh, he died when an eagle dropped a, a tortoise on his head. <laughs> yeah, because according to legend, eagles picked up tortoises and attempt uh, to crack them open by dropping them on rocks. Oh. An eagle mistook Aeschylus's head for a rock because he was bald <laughs> and dropped it on, on him instead. <laughs> Good. You know, one of the greatest drama minds of all time just dropped Well, it's it. quite a dramatic death. No, it's, it's not. It's funny. <laughs> okay, it's, but it it's might, random. It's Come on, it's not a tragedy, but drama is in theatre. Okay, so um, next we have Francis Bacon. Oh yeah, in sixteen fifty-two, oh, yeah. uh, who was watching a snowstorm and was struck by the wondrous notion that maybe snow could be used to preserve meat in the same way that salt was used. Uh, determined to find out... Hey, he, hey, he invented the refrigerator! He, par he purchased a, a chicken from a nearby village, killed it, and then, standing outside in the snow, attempted to stuff the chicken full of snow to freeze it. Yeah? What? He caught pneumonia, of course. Oh, of course <laughs> and he did. Yeah. And it didn't work. Well, well, it might have worked. Yeah, but he died. He, he died. He could have taken the snow in and tried it inside. 
Well, then it would have. He was a smart, a smart guy. He was, but he had. He was dedicated to science. That's the empirical method. <laughs> no, th that's how you die. You don't do that. <laughs> I mean, preserve yourself in order to mm. keep back to science. I mean, mm. Mm. I mean, that's sad. That's sad. That's sad for the for us, Iskalis and Francis Bacon. Yeah, but come on, we're laughing now. That's. That's not sad. I mean, good for them. Good for them. They gave us something to laugh about so many years later. I'm, I'm really happy. Yeah, this is eternal life. And then we have a, a fellow called Jim Fix, mm. who was the author of the best-selling complete book of running. Okay. Uh, which uh, started the jogging craze of the 1970s. Really? Yeah. I'm wondering where this is going to go. Can anyone, can anyone guess? He, he, he... Okay. <laughs> Fix was visiting uh, Greensboro, Vermont, when uh, he walked out of his house and began jogging. He'd only gone a, a short distance when he had a massive coronary. Ah. His autopsy revealed that one of his coronary arteries was 99% clogged, another was 80% ob obstructed, and a third was 70% blocked and that Fix had had three other attacks in the weeks prior to his death. So he was unlucky. He was just unlucky. That's not dumb. Lots of people no, this is, this is irony. This is pure irony. irony. He created the craze for jogging yeah. in the 70s, and he was half clogged. <laughs> <laughs> he, he died running. And it killed him. I mean, come on. He died happy. No, he died running. That's, <laughs> that's different. We... <laughs> who are going to die eating are going to be happy people. He died running, so there. Okay, that's brilliant. Thank you very much, Artemis. Um Now, Rob Priest has sent us a message that I called him on the wrong phone number, which seems slightly unlikely given that we got his voicemail. But we'll try <laughs> again. Okay, Rob, here we go. Second time lucky, eh? Hello. Oh, hello, Rob. We thought we thought for a minute you were ignoring us. No, what happened is you rang my mobile and um, I don't get mobile reception in this country ever. So, okay. Um, so I would not recommend O2, by the way, to <laughs> Okay, so we've disendorsed Starbucks and O2 today. <laughs> oh, online. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, but that would be my fault then. That's probably that's probably a, a <laughs> pretty typical. Um. So now, Rob, we have two things to talk to you about. Right. One is context versus facts. <sighs> yeah, that old chestnut. That old chestnut. And the other, I believe, is Ernst Renan. No. No. Damn it. Uh, I want to talk about radio. <laughs> oh, let's talk about radio. That, that's very meta. Uh, uh, well, can we do Renan one week? We've now dangled him in front of our listeners. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. One week. One week. Yep. One week in the future. All right. So let's let's speed through this issue of context and facts. Now, yep. Artemis, who I'm going to put, you probably can't hear her, but she's online. She's on air. Artemis, you're going to make a cogent case about why context is not a fact. No. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not because I, well, from what I hear, everyone agreed with me. Thank you, listeners. But then I, I got censored, so I'm really sorry. I'm not. I'm not going to participate in you that didn't anymore. You did get censored. I did get censored. <laughs> Nobody got. Everyone got censored because I gave up. So Adamus reckons context is not a fact. Uh, Rob reckons context is a fact. Rob, you're going to tell us why. Um, well, no. I mean, no, I think there's the argument to be made for both. My my problem is that you have been counting context as fact, and then, you know, you can't just change the game midway through. Otherwise, how am I ever going to beat 21 when you were counting it as fact? I'm really sorry. I wasn't counting all these times. Tamsin alone was counting. No, and I'm when the about. watchdog walked in, she failed. I'm really sorry. It's Tamsin's fault. That's what I'm, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> I see. So Adamus is now Ofcom, and I am like a, a, a misbehaving broadcaster. That's You're Rebecca Brooks. I'm Rebecca Brooks. Oh, she's <laughs> I, 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 I know this is slightly not okay to say, but I think she's quite hot. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. probably that's probably uh, not okay to say. Not okay to say. <laughs> but but everyone in this room is nodding. Yeah. Thank you very I'm much. Um. All right, well, we've settled that. But we also believe, don't we, Rob? Oh, well, I certainly do. Do you want to say something, Artemis? Yeah. 
No one was nodding. Everyone was like, yeah, not, not that much. And she was like, yeah, everyone agrees. That's what I'm talking about. Thank you very much. See you next week. <laughs> okay, this is the gang up on Adam and Shay. Um, Tracy, I think, I think well, Adamus and I are having a conflictual engagement here. I'm certainly not being nice to her, right? That is true. That is true. Okay. <laughs> we, just, we just want that on, on the record for our listener out there. Um, Rob. Um, yeah. So, tell me about radio. Well, radio, I was just thinking about technology. You As know, you do. There's been a lot in the news about, you know, HMV gang bursts and the rise of MP3s, and then there was also all this talk about open access journals, mm. a big debate in higher education at the moment, mm. and, you know, about how forms of technology seem to be shifting in ways that are undermining older forms, and that sort of older forms kind of... You know, some of them just will simply not survive in the form um, that they were in. And I was thinking radio is interesting, isn't it? Because radio precedes all of these technologies and yet still has dedicated listeners and uh, maybe not this show, but... Um, and, we um, have... you know... Rob, we have a dedicated listener. Sorry, that was too easy. And, um, you know, and people... I still listen to the radio um, a mm. lot. I don't think that's because I'm an old fogey. I think people listen to the radio in their cars. I think people listen to the radio when they're doing work. Um, and I think it's kind of incredible that radio has weathered the storms of technological change. Well, I can't agree with you more, obviously. That's why I'm, you know, investing in it. But um, uh, I think there's something very intimate about the radio, too. It's this, it's this whispering in your ear. It's not, it's, yeah. not, it's not like, you know, you don't, have to cons- you don't have to go out of your way to consume it. It's just there. You can be on exactly. at night, you know. And the funny thing is we have all these things like, you know, DAB and podcasts and internet radio, but in a way they're all just supplements. They haven't actually replaced... I mean, Mm. I listen to podcasts, but I also listen to the radio, and I think that's probably true of lots of people. Mm. Um, So, yeah. It's also quite a social thing, isn't it? In that you can be on and there can be a lot of people in the room sort of going about their stuff. I mean, apparently in Africa, radio is the means of communication. Right. TV TV is like a no-show compared to um, the the, the hundreds and hundreds of uh, um, stations. There's, there's a lot of gesticulating going on in the back row. Um, so this is the future. We can we can look forward to a great and glorious. Do you think digital? Well, you know, I was also thinking about the past. I was thinking because I listened to a radio, and then I was thinking things have changed. You know, I listened to a radio station called Seep, which um, is a French radio station, but which has or had a cult following in Britain. Um, and it was founded in the 1970s. Um, and then for a long time, and I think even today, you could listen to it on the radio waves in Brighton because uh, people put up pirate mm. transmitters that retransmitted the signal from mm. Dieppe yeah. um, into Brighton um, so that people could listen to it, which is exciting. You know, that people would risk basically, you know, prosecution to retransmit a foreign radio station. I thought in this week when we're... Uh, when we're talking so much about Europe, <laughs> it's a nice example of the lengths people will go to to you know, engage in European culture, um, a shared European culture. That's right, a shared... Of, we're all European, aren't we, exactly. in this room, aren't we? We are, oh, except for me, of course. <laughs> for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, and, um, but... but um, that's, there's something very mechanical about that transmission, which is... I mean, I know digital radio is also mechanical, but we, we have managed to sort of um, find new ways of creating communities that don't rely on that kind of retransmission and proximity and locality. Right, exactly. I mean, I listen to feed on um, a, a... Well, I have a concrete radio set, but it, it will do internet radio and digital radio, and it's the easiest thing in the world. You know, I don't have mm. to worry about somebody putting up a transmitter in Cambridge mm. to... To retransmit sleep. So, yeah, it has changed. But again, I still think this is all, it's all kind of things which have supplemented the core functions of radio, um, which I can't really see ever ending, which is bizarre, isn't it? It, it is bizarre, but we like continuity as well as change. And, you know, all the things that have tried 
to replace it. You have, you know, these in- internet services, iTunes, Last FM, whatever, that randomly generate music that's, that's catered to your taste or whatever. They're never quite as good, and they're never quite as surprising and interesting, and they never quite take you back in the same way that radio does. Well, actually, Rob, I have very strong opinions about that, but I'd like to take a survey of the young people in the room to see how many of them listen to radio stations that curate music for you or that use these specialised, personalised services. Tavinda? Both. Both? Oh, microphone. Both, actually. I think radio is more for the conversations you get between radio presenters and then the other services for actual music, because I tend to hate the music on radio. Uh Uh-huh, Interesting. I, I only listen to the radio when I'm driving, so it doesn't really... It's yeah. not really a part of my life. Does anyone else use these personal...? Nope, never. Radio all the way. Yeah, I don't like the radio at all. <laughs> um, I don't like listening to people talking to each other, and I don't like the adverts, so... Like what we right, do. Well, I just right. you know, this is... This is one of the things about FEEP. One of the reasons FEEP is a cult radio station is it has no adverts, and the presenters say about two lines every hour. Well, there you go, Josie. Feet. Get F-I-P. into it. FIP. FIP. <laughs> um, we, we, we are nothing if not collegial here at Student Radio Brunel. Um, Rob, thank you very much. We're going to um, shunt off now because we've got four minutes to go. But uh, okay. it was lovely to talk to you uh, in this way. Maybe we could do this again. Yeah, why not? Okay, why not? All right. Okay. Goodbye. Bye. Have a good Bye. week. Bye. Um, thank you, Rob. That was uh, enlightening. Um, yeah, we didn't do 60 seconds. Mm, maybe that's just disappearing, disappearing. Now, I think we have Tavinda to go, don't we? We have Beard or Babe. Tavinda, what is it? Hello. Well, last week it was requested that I do a bearded babe. Ooh. So I've complied with the request and found quite a few bearded babes. <laughs> most of them end up in circuses. It's quite <laughs> tragic. <laughs> most, most of them, at least throughout the 20th century, ended up in circuses. The, old, the oldest one I found was um, Julia Pastrana, or Julia Pastrana, because she, bo- she was born in Mexico, mm-hmm. and she was born in 1834. She, she was found in Mexico by a man named Theodore Lent, who purchased her from her mother. Oh. He bought her, took oh. her to Europe, and then taught her how oh. to dance, how to sing, and then he essentially put her on exhibition. Oh, no. Yeah, so it, it was. It was. It, her life is interesting. She was um, advertised in her career as an ape and a human, mm. a bear woman. She. Some people, a doctor certified that she was a result of a mating of a human and an orangutan. Not okay. <laughs> <laughs> Not okay. Yeah, when she was really just a Mexican Indian woman. Not okay. It. It was. It was sad. But, um, yeah, so she, the man who took her, bought her, she eventually married him and she became pregnant. And while they were touring Mo- Me- Moscow, while they were touring Moscow in Russia, she gave birth to a child who had the same condition as her. And the child died three days later and she died five days later. So she died of childbirth. It was really sad. Was the child born with a full beard? Child was hairy, two inch, yeah. two inch of hair all over the body. But this is actually, I don't know if when I have Wikipedia handy, I would look this up. This is actually a, a condition. Um, yeah. And some of the royal family, I think of Spain. It's, or it's France a genuine condition, condition. Yeah. yeah. It's hereditary, yeah. so it can go through, go through the bloodline. Uh, yeah. And um, the, her husband, so after the child and the mother died, he didn't abandon the tour. He didn't go, I'm going to mourn for my wife and child. He embalmed them, got them mummified. The process took six months, but he embalmed them, got them mummified, put them in a glass cabinet, and carried on touring. Mm, mm. He essentially toured with them as pickled mm. specimens for twenty years. Got Come on, a man. Oh, well, if there's just ever horrified. Any proof that marriage is about property? This is it. Yeah, completely. And the the mummies disappeared. In sort of 1921, and they in the they British just... Museum <laughs> probably. <laughs> <laughs> well, they ended up in Norway's version of the British Museum. <laughs> uh, probably. Yeah. Only if they're Greek or Turkish yeah. or Egyptian. We are. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so it's it's a really oh, sad it's life. Okay. And then there were there were two other women. Well, can we do one? I think we're well, not... they both had sort of similar stories. Oh. They ended up in a circus. The guy who was running the circus would hold publicity stunts where they would be kidnapped or end up in a court case for something and they would be famous for being the hairy women. 
That's and having huge beards. Quite creative. Mm. <sighs> it's it's, it's, it's men controlling thing. women. That's what it it's is. The history of the world, um, and it's a terrible thing. Um, <laughs> okay, so we've got to rush through now because our next um, the next slot is here. But we're going to do a quick new segment, um, which I've got a small um, introductory song for. <laughs> Once a jolly swagman can buy a billabong under the shade. Of That's right. <laughs> I'm the man who mothers kangaroos. Uh, you can read this in the edition of the Metro today. Um, I'm the woman that mothers kangaroos. So we're going to have we're going to have a new segment in which I get tested on how Australian I am. And Jagvir is here. So Jagvir, hello. Hey. Hi. Speaking to say hello. <laughs> yes. Hello. Hello. Um, so so hit me. Uh, well, actually, I had a question which oh I my thought God, I could put Jack to you. Jack is going off off script. Okay. <laughs> you should know this. Yeah. In protest about Obama being elected, an American said, and I'd like you to point out the three wrong things he said, that he was going to move to Australia because their president was a Christian, mm. and he said what he meant. Well, the president's not a he. There is no president, and she's not a Christian. Exactly. Woohoo! Oh. <laughs> um, What's her name? Her name Julia is Gillard. Julia Gillard. Uh, she was actually born in Wales. Um, but, yeah, she's our first female president, prime minister, and you should listen, watch the video of her taking down the leader of the opposition for being a big, fat, misogynist prick. Um, JV, so we've got two questions for me. OK, so what's the name of that small island just to the south of Australia's southern coast? It is part of Australia, and it's called Tasmania. Yeah. Yeah, it's a state. Yeah. Yeah. Tick! <laughs> okay. Go. Uh, which yep. point of Australia did the Brit Captain Cook discover? Obviously, with discover in quotation marks. Is that on there? Yeah, yeah. I Nothing. see it. What? You don't. Oops. You're making up. <laughs> I mean, Captain Cook first. Well, I don't know if he first. This is not really the place that he necessarily first discovered, but he landed and, and docked in um, Botany Bay. Yeah. Yeah? I'll give you that. Woohoo! Um, excellent. Well, we can return to this fun game next week. But um, <laughs> I'd just like to thank everyone the great team Tavinda, Artemis, Jagfit, Julia, Ben, Josie, and <laughs> Rob, Erica, uh, for a really good week. <laughs> all the Europeans. All the Europeans place. in this room. We're all Europeans, everyone. <laughs> David Cameron, suck on that. <laughs> <All right. laughs>